What does it mean to be 2% Neanderthal? When we look at human genetics versus other living species, like chimpanzees and bonobos, we're usually talking about what it means to compare our entire genomes, laying them side by side, and just count the proportion of times that those genomes are different from each other or similar to each other. So if we do this exercise with a human genome and a chimpanzee genome, what we'll discover is that we can align the two genomes to compare only the similar sections of the genome, and when they're aligned, we can count the differences, and those differences between a human and a chimpanzee, or between a human and a bonobo, are going to be around about 2% of the overall length of the genomes. So that's a straightforward statistic that tells us how similar we are to chimpanzees and bonobos. It doesn't tell us that chimpanzees are our ancestors. In fact, all of the differences that have arisen between human genomes and chimp and bonobo genomes are differences that have arisen since the common ancestors of chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans lived. Those differences, in other words, are signs of the two lineages of humans and the chimpanzee bonobo lineage and their evolutionary history over time. When we talk about Neanderthals being around about 2% of the ancestry of a living person, we're talking about a very different kind of statistic. In this case, we're not laying the genomes side by side and comparing them. This isn't a simple count of similarity. Instead, it's an estimate of how much of the ancestry of a given person that Neanderthals would make up among all of the ancestors that that person had at the time that Neanderthals lived. It's not a straightforward comparison. It's not something that we can see with our eyes. It's something that we have to apply a statistical model to try to estimate. Now, if we do the exercise where we lay a human genome, like mine, next to a Neanderthal genome and say, how different are they from each other? they're much more similar to each other than humans are to chimps or bonobos. In fact, a human genome like mine and a Neanderthal genome are different only about 0.15% of the time. So they're about 99.85% identical to each other and about 0.15% different from each other. That means that they're more than 10 times more alike than my genome is like a chimpanzee's or bonobo's genome the genetic similarities between humans and Neanderthals much higher. But genetic similarity isn't enough to answer the question of how much Neanderthals may have contributed to my ancestry. We have the same problem fundamentally as we have when we look at a human versus a chimpanzee. I can lay my genome next to a chimps and they're, they're similar does not mean that the chimpanzee is my ancestor. It means that we share common ancestors with each other, and we've inherited those similarities from those distant common ancestors. We could easily have inherited most of our genetic similarities with Neanderthals from our common ancestors with them. And in fact, that's exactly what we did. Most of the similarities that we have with Neanderthals are similarities that come from the fact that we share common ancestors. So how can we tell that a Neanderthal is ancestral to somebody living today? The way that we do this is by comparing different humans with each other and with Neanderthals. When we observe that some humans are more like Neanderthals than others, the explanation for that is that those humans have Neanderthals in their ancestry or at least a population that's genetically fundamentally like Neanderthals. So this isn't a comparison of just one person's DNA and a Neanderthal. It's a comparison of many people's DNA with each other and with Neanderthal DNA. When we do this comparison across human populations, what we discover is that populations from places outside of Africa are systematically slightly more similar to the Neanderthal genome than populations that live in sub-Saharan Africa today. So no matter where you're from outside of Africa, 
You could be European, you could be South Asian, you can be East Asian, you could be Aboriginal Australian, Native American, everybody outside of Africa. And I'll add, most people in North Africa and some people in East Africa, you have more similarity to the Neanderthal genome than do people who live in Sub-Saharan Africa now. There's a very systematic difference among humans in terms of who's more similar to Neanderthals and others. This similarity is not very extensive. If we look at the most similar person that we know about outside of Africa versus the least similar person to Neanderthals living in Sub-Saharan Africa, we'll discover that they only differ in Neanderthal similarity by less than 5%. It's a very small fraction of the overall genetic differences and similarities to Neanderthals that mark different human populations from each other. But that very small fraction is consistent. People who have origins outside Africa, people who are from North Africa and Northeastern Africa, they have some Neanderthal similarity that Sub-Saharan Africans do not. The best explanation for this is that these people everywhere in the world have ancestry from Neanderthals or from a very Neanderthal-like population. Now, I'm being really conservative in interpreting that, right? Because the fact is that when we look at Neanderthal genetics, we're sequencing the DNA of some dead Neanderthals that may very well not have been ancestral to any later Neanderthals, much less any living people. We're trying to infer the relationships of populations by looking at individuals within them. And those individuals are genetically diverse. One of the most exciting things that we've learned about Neanderthals from their genetics is just how diverse they are. Neanderthals in Central Asia, for example, the very high quality Neanderthal genome that's come from Denisova Cave, are different from Neanderthals in Europe. Those differences are almost as great as differences between any living human populations today. So the Neanderthals had within them, more than 50,000 years ago, a substantial store of variation. And that store of variation, we don't yet know how it contributed to later human populations. It could be that we got most of our Neanderthal genetics from only one small part of the Neanderthal population. In fact, when we look at all the Neanderthals that we have DNA from, we find that we're most similar to a Neanderthal individual from Mesmyskaya, which is a site in the Caucasus Mountains in Russia. The fact that we can show that some Neanderthals are more similar to humans than others is a pretty good sign that some of those Neanderthal populations were contributing to our human population and other Neanderthal populations may have contributed little or nothing at all. Neanderthals were not all alike. We've gotten some of their variability, but not all of it. Now, what did we get from Neanderthals? This is a tremendously interesting question for us anthropologists, because Neanderthals have historically been viewed as a population that had many specializations. It was very different from humans in many ways. What we are, in fact, discovering is that the sort of obvious things that you might look at as things that Neanderthals could have contributed to later populations, by and large, they didn't. For example, skin pigmentation. When we look at the Neanderthal genome, we see that they had at least one pigmentation variation in a gene called MC1R. This gene in living humans has variations also, and those variations relate to pigmentation. Some variations of MC1R tend to reduce the activity of that molecule, and by doing so, they prevent pheomelanin, the red pigment, from being converted into eumelanin, the black pigment, inside of our pigment cells. Well, if we don't convert pheomelanin to eumelanin, we end up with reddish pigments instead of dark brown or black pigments. And some people with mutations to MC1R have red hair. Other people have freckles. So there are really pigmentation variations that we can see today in this gene. But none of the ones that we see in living human populations are variations that we also see in Neanderthal genetics.
we don't see today's pigment variations for this gene in the Neanderthals. We see at least one different mutation, a mutation that we haven't found in any living people, but that seems from its molecular basis that it would also have reduced the activity of the gene. We can infer from genetics that Neanderthals had similarities to redheaded people in their phenotype, even though today's redheaded people do not share the same genetics from those ancient Neanderthals. Well, that's very interesting because when we look at today's pigmentation variations, we have more than two dozen genetic changes in humans that relate to lighter pigment or different pigment. We haven't found any of those in the Neanderthal genome. Pigmentation is something that you might think is something that would have been valuable in ancient Neanderthals because they lived in northern climates where insulation from the sun was lower and where today pigmentation variation has really sprung up, and lighter pigmentation in particular. We did not, as far as we can tell, inherit those pigment variations from Neanderthals. Instead, we evolved them much more recently. It looks like, for the most part, within the past 20,000 years. Well, if Neanderthals didn't give us pigmentation variation, what did they give us? We know of two areas. One area is immunity. We have found a number of genes related to immunity where there is a Neanderthal version of the gene and that gene is common in some later human populations outside of Africa. Those immunity-related variations include variations in the famous human leukocyte antigen, or HLA loci. The HLA is one of the most diverse parts of the human genome. It consists of several genes, and those genes each in living people have many different forms that are functionally different, many different alleles. Some of those forms go way back in time. In fact, for one of your alleles, you might be more similar to a chimpanzee or a gorilla than you are to the other allele that you carry. That's just how diverse they are. We've retained variation in those genes for millions of years. The reason why we've maintained that variation is probably because rare variations for the HLA loci have an advantage. When you think of what the immune system has to do, and what the HLA system in particular has to do, it is recognize and defend against different kinds of pathogens. And a good defense against a pathogen that's spreading through your population is to have a version of one of these genes that's different from everybody else. Because then the bacterium or virus that's affecting others will avoid you. So variation is bred into these genes by the process of natural selection, and selection in favor of rare variations. In that context, it's easy to understand how a Neanderthal version of the gene would have an advantage in later humans. Because when humans interbred with Neanderthals and took on board some of their genetics, that genetic variation was immediately valuable if it allowed people to have resistance to diseases that were passing through the human population as it emerged from Africa. So Neanderthal genetics could create a valuable defense against pathogens by adding diversity to the human population, and that's what it looked like it did for at least some immune system genes. Another area of the genome where Neanderthals seem to have contributed disproportionately to humans today outside of Africa has to do with keratin filaments. Now, keratin is a protein that's found in nails and hair and in the skin. Everybody makes it, but it's a complex system of genetic controls on how much of it you make and the form that's made when it's laid down in different types of tissues. So you can get a picture of that when you look at the hair of different people around the world. Some people have short, frizzy hair. Some people have kinky hair. Some people have very long, flowing hair. Some people have thick hair. Some people have thin hair. That has to do with the way that keratin is laid down in the hair follicles. When we look at Neanderthal genetics and compare it to human genetics around the world, we see that some Neanderthal-derived genes are more common than expected, and those genes include several that are related to keratin.
Now, we don't know what effect these genes had. We'll have to do experiments to see people who carry these genes and people who don't carry these genes to understand what phenotypes they're associated with. Could it be that the hair form or the thickness of the skin or something to do with the nails or the beard or something like that is inherited by some living people from Neanderthals? It seems plausible and you can sort of see a logic to it. If there's a relationship between the climates that Neanderthals lived in and were adapted to and the climates where people live today. But the fact is, we don't yet understand exactly how these genes work or what effects the Neanderthal versions of these genes may have. It's a case where our understanding of the Neanderthal contribution to us is no longer limited by what we know about Neanderthal genetics. We have whole genomes from Neanderthals and we can see what people have now. Instead, our knowledge about what we inherited from them and what's important is limited by our knowledge of how these genes work in people now. It's limited, in other words, by human biology. For an anthropologist, that's a really exciting thing to say because what it means is that when we're studying the evolution of humans from these ancient ancestors, and when we're getting data about their genomes, we can actually use those data to come to a better understanding of how our genes work. When we look at things that we don't know enough about, like how our hair is formed, and think, what could Neanderthals teach us about that? You see the power of understanding ancient genetics. It's not just about the stories that we can tell about ancient people and their interactions. It's about how our evolution allows us to discover more things about how our bodies function. And that will enable us to go deeper and deeper into our biology and discover more things about our relationships to ancient hominids.